what's going to happen now, you see, so far we've been focused on the philosophy of science, basically on the transitions in the mosaic. That's what we've been studying so far. We've been studying the transitions and the logic in transitions. What's the logic of scientific change, whether there is a universal scientific method, can we know anything for certain, what's the difference between science and pseudoscience, all these things. What's going to happen now, we're going to focus on the content of the mosaic. And we're going to start with the Aristotelian medieval worldview. Now you tell me, why would anyone bother studying something that has been abandoned more than 300 years ago? Why would anyone study the worldviews of the past? Uh, I think it might be useful just for helping us understand our current worldviews. In what way? Because if there's been a certain logic and a law governed process from one mosaic to another, then the content of uh, ancient views has affected our current views. Okay, any other ideas? I'm going to help you a little bit. What picture of science would you have if you didn't know anything about the pre-18th century science? What sort of a picture of science would you have? Suppose for the sake of argument that this thing here, the Aristotelian medieval mosaic, never existed. Suppose science, the actual science, started sometime in the 18th century. What sort of a picture of science would you have? In terms of the scientific change, scientific method, what sort of beliefs about science would you have as philosophers of science? Now try to think about all those issues that we've been discussing so far. Lecture 4, Lecture 5, Lecture 6. You'd have a much simpler view of the past and you'd say, well, their science wasn't real, they didn't look critically at the world, and we now have science and we look critically. Yeah, yeah. Without the past mosaics, you could come to the conclusion that there's only there's a static method and that it's the hypothetical deductive method. Essentially, that is the answer I was looking for. Very good. Thank you very much. Now, you would be surprised, or maybe not, if I told you that even some 50 years ago, that was exactly the picture the philosophers of science and the historians of science would have in mind, most of them. Even nowadays, in popular literature, you open popular texts, and most of them ignore the Aristotelian medieval science. And because they ignore that science, they arrive at a very simplistic, as Miriam mentioned, very simplistic notion of science. What's that notion? That there is a universal and fixed method of science, and it does the job. That's it. Everything before that is not really science. That would be extremely simplistic, and you know the major drawback of this approach. If we ever decided to accept this approach, we'd have to be prepared that the science of the future would dismiss us as not really scientific. We understand this, don't we? Very good. So what do we do? I think we have to be more humble than we used to be and try and study the science of the past without trying to dismiss it. I'm not asking you to accept the actual content of the science of the time. God forbid, no. There is a reason why those theories were abandoned 300 years ago. So those are not, by any means, the best theories we have at the moment. But what it teaches us, it teaches us that science changes, and not only scientific theories, but also the scientific methods. And this is the idea. If you ask me why is it important to study the Aristotelian medieval science, the most important reason is that it teaches you and it shows you that you can have a genuine science with a different scientific method. Why do we believe it's science? Well, because we believe that it obeyed the four laws of scientific change. Okay, so what was that mosaic? The first thing we have to know, and I think this is the thing that you already know, the key elements of this mosaic were accepted until the end of the 17th century. What are the elements? In the middle we have the natural philosophy of physics. This one is humorous physiology here. What's this one? Astrology, right. And this one would be cosmology. This one is theology, right. This one you may or may not know. This is what we call metaphysics. Mathematics here natural history, optics, and finally, the grand Aristotelian medieval methods. As you can expect, I'm going to start 
from the Aristotelian physics. Now, the beginning is very simple. This is something that you already know. The four elements, air, fire, earth, water. Which two of these elements are heavy? Water and earth, right? And these two are light. The law of natural motion says that all elements in their natural state tend to reach their natural positions and to remain there. This is a universal law that the Aristotelians accepted. They thought that every element has a natural position and it has the natural tendency to get to that position. Okay? Now, the outcome actually depends on what that natural position is or where that natural position is. For heavy elements, the natural position was thought to be the center of the universe. And as a result of this, you get a law of natural motion for heavy elements, which would be heavy elements tend to collect in the center of the universe. You all know this. This is nothing new for you. For light elements, the natural position is the periphery of the terrestrial region, sublunar region. You put these two together and you arrive at the law of natural motion for light elements. Light elements tend towards the periphery of the terrestrial region. It is because of this that we observe the arrangement of elements the way they are. This is simple. Element Earth naturally gathers in the center of the universe, then comes the layer of water and the layer of air, the layer of fire. This is just a repetition. This is something you've already known. Now let's proceed to something that you may or may not know. First, tell me, why do you think they believed in four elements? Why exactly four? What sort of intuitive experience would lead you to that belief? You understand they were Aristotelians and therefore they had to only accept things which were grasped intuitively by an experienced person. Therefore, anyone who had experience with the world should be in a position to arrive at this conclusion. So why do you think they arrived at this conclusion? Hi, my name's Lenore. Um, is it because those are the things that you absolutely need to survive? Oh, uh, that's interesting. In what way? So, it. Earth would provide you with the food, you have to absolutely have water, fire would provide you with heat and shelter, etc., and air in order to breathe it. This is one of the most unique answers I've ever heard. Absolutely incorrect, but very unique. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious about that. I could have never possibly thought about it myself, honestly. That's, that's brilliant. You see, in philosophy, the first thing you learn is to appreciate brilliant wrong answers. Very good, thank you. Now, anyone else? Oh, okay, Danny over there. Wouldn't it be because intuitively they see things that are solidly shaped and they say, okay, this is Earth because it holds its shape. Then they would see that some things absorb the shape of their containers and that would be liquid. And then air is everything else other than fire because those are the four things that they, they observe in their reality. That's essentially the reason. Even these days, if you ask professional physicists what states are there for matter, what would they say? Is a solid state? Is a liquid state? Is a gaseous? And in Britain they say gases, I think. And there's also plasma. So even to this day, we have some similarity. So there is something to that. Essentially, if you just observe and summarize, it is quite natural that you intuitively arrive at this system. And we know from the history of science that many different cultures arrived at this idea independently. So there was something natural about this distinction. Okay, one thing they believed about these four elements is that they are characterized by the so-called sensible qualities. Those qualities would be cold and hot, like that, and also wet and dry. So as a result, you have fire that is dry and hot, you have earth that is dry and cold, you have water that is wet and cold, and finally you have air which is wet and hot. These are different elements, but they're all characterized by a combination of the two. If you accept this principle, this opens number of possibilities for you. The first one is the idea of transformability, that elements can actually transform to one another. So what do you do in order to transform them? You just change their sensible qualities. If you can take something cold and turn it to hot, you would change the element. The best example that you have is this one, water. Water consists almost 
almost entirely of element water. There might be some, some other mixtures of other elements, some traces, but it's mostly element water. So what happens is that heating of water changes its quality from cold to hot and thus turns it into vapor air. You understand the logic here? Now tell me what happens when you burn some wood. What sort of transformation takes place there? Anyone wants to try it? Let's go step by step, okay? So what sort of a combination of elements are we dealing with here? How would you describe it? Is it heavy or is it light? Um, hi, my name is Nikki. It's, the wood is heavy. It's heavy. Therefore, what sort of elements would it be mostly composed of? Earth and water? So there should be some water, right? Yeah. It's not pure earth, therefore it should be some, some yeah. combination of the two. So we are here in the cold. Yeah. So what happens in burning? You are right, we start from something cold, and then what happens? You get some vapor, therefore water turns into air, and the earthly part, it turns into fire. In a similar fashion, they explained each and every transformation that you can come across. Let's move on. If you accept the idea of transformability, does it make sense to study those transformations? What do you think? If you know that the world allows for transformations to happen. Can you have actually science about that? Yes, you can. What would be the name for that science? The science that studies transformations. Hi, my name is Michaela and it would be alchemy. Exactly. So the very possibility of alchemy follows from the Aristotelian principle of transformability. Do you see this? Do you see how they arrive at that? It doesn't really tell you that you have to accept alchemy as a working theory. You may or may not have a full-fledged theory. But one thing they never questioned is the possibility of alchemy. If you ask anyone, they say, of course, the transformability is possible and therefore the science of those transformations should also be possible. It's another question whether you have such a science. The idea that alchemy is a scientific discipline was beyond, beyond question. So that's alchemy. Now, Few things about their physiology and medicine. Humorous physiology and medicine. Let's take Socrates, a human being, Socrates as always. They believe that a human body contains four bodily fluids, the so-called humors. Here they are. You have blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. Four fluids, four humors. This is the humoral theory of medicine. Hippocrates, Galen, they all believed, the great physicians of the past, they all believed in this theory. This was actually the accepted theory all the way until the 18th century. Every humor has a predominant element, and this explains why there must be four fluids. Why? Well, because what is it that can make one fluid different from another? They're all composed of four elements, right? Essentially, everything is composed of four elements. Therefore, the only thing that can be different between any two fluids, any two humors, is the predominant element. Like that, you get more air, that gives you blood. The predominant element is air. When the predominant element is fire, you get yellow bile. When the predominant element is earth, you get black bile. And finally, for phlegm, the predominant element is water. It doesn't mean that there are no other elements. Essentially, the combination of all of them, and mostly water, we understand that. Therefore, by virtue of their corresponding elements, humors are also characterized as dry or wet, hot or cold. And as you can see, there is a nice symmetry between the four elements here and the four humors. What does this give us? Every individual, according to this theory, has a particular balance of humors, a balance that you are born with. So what is natural for you may or may not be natural for me. Let's say for Socrates, suppose this is his natural balance of humors. Blood, yellow bile, phlegm, black bile. Suppose this is his natural balance, the balance that he is born with. If you consider Plato here, he may or may not have a similar balance and chances are he's gonna have a different natural balance. Let's say this one is for Plato, you see he has a predominant black bile as opposed to Socrates here, who has predominant phlegm. You understand I'm making this up, right? I don't have any historical data as far as the balances are concerned. 
Aristotle here, predominant blood, and finally Democritus here, predominant yellow bile. Again, these are the balances that you are born with. A specific balance of the four humors peculiar to the individual. This has a name. What do you think is the name? This is definition. So, a balance peculiar to an individual is called, you know the name? Anyone guess? It's called temper or temperament. So depending on the balance, you get different tempers. So there are four basic temperaments. If your predominant humor is blood, then your temperament is sanguine, meaning you are very positive and outgoing and active and life-loving and friendly. That's what you are. If your predominant humor is phlegm, then you are phlegmatic. You all know what phlegmatic is. If your predominant humor is black bile, then you're melancholic. Predominant humor, yellow bile, you are choleric, easily aggravated, very often angry. I'm going to give you a few medieval drawings on the subject. So this is sanguine, very insisting and very active. You see how he pursues the lady, literally pursues. <laughs> and here you have, you see, phlegmatic, slightly distant, more romantic. And then you have melancholic, is the other way around, and he's lying in a bed, you see. And uh, this one should be uh, actually censored because it's the 21st century. That's, that's choleric and uh, we're not going to have that. <laughs> right. Uh, more traditional symbols would be this ones. You have sanguine, phlegmatic, melancholic, and choleric. Now, which temperament is this? Phlegmatic. phlegmatic, because the predominant element is phlegm. Okay. Which one is this? Plato. Melancholic. Aristotle. Sanguine, and finally, Democritus, choleric. Very good. So, this is all clear. Again, I do not insist that this is the correct description of their actual temperaments. I have no idea what they were. People are born with different temperaments. But why are they born with different temperaments? What is it that determines your temper? It should depend on something. It cannot be random, right? The Aristotelian world is not a random world by any means. There must be reason for everything, or almost for everything. Therefore, there must be some sort of a factor that determines why some people are born choleric, others are born sanguine, some are more optimistic, others are more pessimistic. There should be some explanation for this. So what do you think is that determines the temperament? The answer is natal horoscope. Natal horoscope. I'm going to explain this. Before we get to astrology, we have to start with basic cosmology and their views on the structure of the universe. This is the typical diagram showing the structure of the universe. You have the terrestrial region, the Earth is in the center of the universe, and then you have the celestial region with planets and stars revolving around the Earth. Very good. So here in the terrestrial region, you have the four terrestrial elements, right? And then in this region, you have ether. The eternal element, ether. Everything is made of ether. The planets and the celestial spheres, everything. Natural motion for ether is circular. But element ether tends to move in circles around the center of the universe. And this explains why planets should revolve around the Earth. They also believed that ether is immutable, meaning that it doesn't come to be and it doesn't cease to be. You cannot generate it, you cannot corrupt it. There is no generation or corruption in the celestial region. Because you see, there is, there is nothing to transform into. In the terrestrial region, there is a generation and corruption because elements transform from one another. That's what happens. In a celestial region, you don't have that. You only have one element. So there can be no generation or corruption. Now imagine yourself in the Aristotelian medieval period. On the one hand, you believe that there are four elements here, and you also believe there is one element up there. And then you notice a very peculiar thing. The celestial region influences the terrestrial region. Here are some examples. The sun is the source of heat and light on the Earth. Everybody agrees, right? This is beyond any doubt. The moon is the cause of ebb and flow, the tides. The sun is the cause of the seasons on the earth. You have 
clear-cut cases when something celestial affects things terrestrial. They believe that the motion of the sphere of stars is due to the prime mover. The motion is then transferred to each of the subsequent spheres, and then eventually it causes all sorts of changes in the terrestrial region. Why would anyone believe in this nonsense? Well, because we have some examples of the celestial region causing things the terrestrial region. Now put these three things together. You have changes here. You have clear-cut indications that these changes are caused by celestial factors. And then you also know that there can be no such thing as generation or corruption in the celestial region because it's essentially eternal. What on earth, or what in the heaven, can possibly cause changes on the earth? It should be something celestial, we know that. But what sort of thing can cause it? In other words, what exactly changes up there? Something does change, but what is it? You cannot have new stars, new planets, because that would be an instance of generation or corruption. The only thing that changes is the relative position of planets, isn't it? That's the only thing that changes. They revolve, and that's the only thing that changes. Therefore, wouldn't it be natural to try and study respective connections between combinations up there and events down here? It is reasonable to study the causal connections between the celestial and the terrestrial regions. Now let's go to astrology. As seen from the Earth, if you are the observer on the Earth, the Sun moves against the background of stars. You see, it moves against the background of stars. It's an annual revolution. The apparent path of the Sun through the course of a year is called ecliptic. The ecliptic is in the center of a belt that we call zodiac. It's a belt. Why do we need this belt? Because the apparent paths of all the planets are within this belt of zodiac. You're not going to find a planet here or a planet there. So essentially, if you look from the Earth, you notice that all the planets revolve roughly in the same plane. Okay? There's a slight deviation, but more or less it's the same plane. And that plane is the one that we call the zodiac. Now, the belt of zodiac consists of 12 30-degree divisions which we call signs. What are the signs? Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces. Now tell me, why exactly 12? We understand it's a division. It could have been 24. Why exactly 12? Why would they make it 12? Danny? Uh, would it coincide with the months of the year? What sort of months? Hi, David. Lunar yeah. cycles. Lunar cycles. How long is lunar month? 29.5 days. Roughly 30 days. Roughly. So they realize that there are roughly 12 months a year, 12 lunar months, lunar cycles. That was the first indication. And so they took 12 as a number. And why is it, why is it that there are 360 degrees? Anyone knows this? There are historical reasons for this. Why 360? Why not 100? Can you guess? This comes from an old Babylon, the Babylonian system of mathematics. Curious system, base 10 and base 60 together. It was a combination of the two. What's the advantage of base 60? It really gives you an advantage because if you take base 10, you can only divide it by 2 and divide it by 5. That's it. For everything else, you need fractions. It's not divisible by 3. It's not divisible by 4. It's not divisible by 6. It's hardly divisible by anything, really. But if you take 60, it's divisible by 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10, 12, 15, 20, 30, 10 numbers. So when you get to dividing things, it's extremely convenient. Okay, so there was a reason for that. Anyways, we digress. So you have 12 signs here. An individual sign, what we call your horoscope, but we really have to say your individual sign, is determined by the position of the sun at the time of your birth. In this particular case, we would have an Aquarius. Each sign 
is associated with one of the four elements. This is what they believed. In a sense that when something happens under that sign, it increases the respective element in a human being and in the surroundings. Let's say it's too rainy in some region. And people would say, well, maybe it has to do something with some water signs predominating. Okay? So not only would it cause changes in human beings, it would also cause changes in nature. Everything was thought to be connected in that way. So you have four triangles. You have here Sagittarius, Aries, and Leo. Those would be your fire signs. Then you have your Capricorn, Taurus, and Virgo. Those would be your earth signs. Then you have your Aquarius, Gemini, and Libra. Those would be your air signs. And finally, Pisces, Cancer, and Scorpio would be your water signs. If you accept this, you also have to accept that it leads to an excess of the associated humor in the body. Just by virtue of leading to excess elements, it has to lead to an excess of the associated humor in the body. Let's take Socrates here, and suppose for the sake of argument that he was born under the sign of Aquarius. This would be his main sign. So he will naturally have excess air and thus excess blood in the body, and he would be what? His temperament? He would be sanguine. What if he was born under the sign of Pisces? The Pisces, more water, more phlegm, therefore phlegmatic. So this is the idea, this is very straightforward. Now, an individual's temper is shaped by the position of the sun. It determines your predominant humor. And it is refined by the positions of other planets. So you see, you can have two different, in this case, Sagittariuses. Both of them would be Sagittariuses, and both of them would be choleric, just by virtue of being Sagittarius. But the balance of other humors would be decided by other planets. They can shape your temper. You see? Different arrangement, different balance, different arrangement, different balance. An individual's temper is determined by the specific placement of the planets at the moment of the individual's birth. Is this clear? There is one more step that we have to take. Once you accept this, it becomes obvious why physicians must know their astrology. So, why is that? Why would a physician have to learn astrology? Can you imagine a doctor learning astrology first? Back then, the doctors, physicians, were expected to know their astrology, or at least to collaborate with a professional astrologer. Why is that? Humor is physiology and medicine. If you ask them, what is health and what is disease? They say, health is a state of perfect balance between the humors. So when you maintain the balance that is natural to you, the one that you're born with, you are healthy. If something goes wrong, if you have more or less of one of the humors, then you are unhealthy. When the balance is not maintained, when you are in a state of imbalance, then you are unhealthy. So these are the basic principles. You take Socrates here, this would be his perfect balance. Suppose this is the balance that he was born with. As you can see, we have a series of issues here with Socrates. In particular, we have some excess of yellow bile, as you can see, and then we have some deficiency of blood and phlegm. So it's a very complex condition. It requires very complex treatment, I assume. If the disease is a state of imbalance, then what's curing? What would you do to cure a person? Curing, essentially, is the restoration of the balance of humors. Now, there can be different means and ways of restoring a patient's balance of humors, but essentially you understand that if you believe that the disease equals imbalance, therefore, curing should be balancing. Let's take Socrates. As you can see, he's quite pale here. Just look at his face. And immediately, as an experienced physician, you provide a diagnosis. You say, well, it is because you have deficiency of blood. I can see your face. And then you have certainly the yellowish color is an indication that you have excess yellow bile in the body and not enough phlegm. So what would you do in order to 
restore blood, build blood. You cannot inject blood. They didn't have that back then. What they did have, they knew some techniques which they believed were conducive towards helping human body to build blood. Okay, so what are you trying to do as a physician? You're trying to create conditions in which the blood builds itself. So what do you do here? You say, well, in order to build the blood, I prescribe that you eat green vegetables and also some moderate exercising. Moderation is the key, right? It's a universal advice for anything. And it helps you to build blood. What about phlegm? Well, drink water. Captain Obvious says, drink water. And also eat fresh fruits, because fresh fruits, not only do they contain water, they're also known for their capacity of building phlegm. So this is what you do. And we got lucky here because these procedures, fresh fruits and green vegetables, they also help to normalize the yellow bile. So you don't really have to prescribe seven different things. It really allows you to solve three issues at the same time. Normalize the yellow bile. Let's take a more difficult case like this one. What can you say as a physician? Look at his face. What can you say? Well, it's a typical case of fever. As you can see, it's all red, burning red. Fever. You have excess blood in the body. And also a deficiency of the black bile, probably. So what do you do? What would you prescribe? Any ideas? The all-time favorite, the bloodletting. So that's what you prescribe. And also, interestingly enough, it was noticed that a moderate, again, notice, moderate, consumption of wine could be prescribed for normalizing black bile because vinous essence is thought to have a link with black bile. So it really helps your body to build that. So essentially what you prescribe is just uh, get drunk and go fight. <laughs> Let's now combine things, shall we? On the one hand, curing is balancing. On the other hand, we know that heavens determine the balance, that your individual balance depends on a particular combination of planets at the moment of your birth. So in this case, if this was the combination of planets, then this would be your temperament, this would be your balance of humors. And therefore, you put this together, the knowledge of astrology is essential for identifying an individual's temper and thus for efficient treatment. Now, astrological forecasts, on the other hand, you cannot really forecast anything if you don't know your astronomy, if you cannot calculate the position. So, astrological forecasts require precise knowledge of the actual positions of planets, we'll give a moment of time, and therefore, as a physician, you're supposed to know astronomy. So if you have a patient and you want to treat that patient, the first thing you have to establish as a medieval physician is what? This is temper. This is what you want to establish. So there is no neutral treatment. There is no such thing. And this is the reason why people believe that the best scenario, the best option is when the physician knows his patients since the childhood. Because you see, Essentially, the dates of birth and the precise natal horoscopes were not really available for common folk. They were only available for kings and other nobility. But for common folk, that wouldn't be available. So how do you know whether a person is melancholic or phlegmatic or sanguine or choleric? You just study his behavior. Just like you know your friends, you know your parents and your brothers and sisters. You meet a person and you say, well, why, why is she so sad? And then a person who knows that person and says, well, she's not sad. That's her natural state of affairs. She, she's always like that because she's melancholic. So, and you say, oh, that's fine. But if you know the person, you know, he's sanguine, and then if something like that happens to the sanguine, you'd say, what's wrong with you? Why are you not out there, you know, killing something or hunting something or, you know, you're doing things, you know, climbing Mount Everest or whatever. You have to do things, right? So as a physician, you're supposed to know astrology. It's safe to say that by the 13th century already, when most of the medieval texts and ancient texts were already translated into Latin, at the time, physicians had huge tables with the description of ailments and the ways of treatment. And for every natural essence, 
they had a table that would explain, okay, you use the root of whatever for treating this. You use this particular vegetable for that, this particular fruit for this. And uh, it was a whole list of things probably the greatest physician, one of the greatest physicians of all times, and certainly the greatest physicians of the medieval period, was Ibn Sina, Avicenna as he is known in the West. And there's a very good movie about this English physician who decided to travel all the way to the Orient to learn from the great Avicenna, because back then in Britain they were only about basically bloodletting, they didn't know anything else. At least that's the way it's presented in the movie. But Avicenna, for instance, they, they were even able to perform eye surgeries. That's how sophisticated they were. His uh, multi-volume canon of medicine was the encyclopedia of the time, the medical encyclopedia of the time. It was huge. So it was translated into Latin and then the new generations of physicians would amend it and, and modify it. And th this is a very good example of something working for wrong reason. So they were right in their treatments. Most of the treatments actually worked, natural remedies specifically. But the reasons were wrong. Nowadays, we no longer believe in four humors. And yet, many of their treatments we still employ in one way or the other. Okay? Very good. So now we're going to move on to the Aristotelian medieval method. You know a thing or two about this method already. And this is the method that says the proposition is acceptable if it's grasped intuitively by an experienced person. You already know that this is extremely vague and any rubbish can seem to be intuitively acceptable. But then again, this is roughly what we believe they demanded, they required. And this method, we know that it was based on two assumptions about the world, on two principles that they believed. Nature of things and intuition grasps nature. The first one, again, I'm just repeating to make sure that we're all on the same page here. A thing has its nature which is basically an indispensable, substantial quality that makes the thing what it is. So for an acorn would be the capacity to grow into an oak tree, for a lion cub to become a full-fledged lion, for a human being, basically the capacity of reason. And this one, intuition grasps nature. This was an important belief that the human mind has a capacity to grasp, to penetrate into the nature of things when it is experienced enough not just randomly, but only when it's experienced enough. When you observe things and observe and observe, and when you gain experience with a certain thing, then intuitively you grasp the nature of things. This was only one of the aspects of their method. Consider this. Back then, they believed that there is a clear-cut distinction between things natural and things artificial. What is a natural thing? This is a definition. A thing is said to be natural when it is not produced artificially and thus has its inner source of change, its nature. I'm going to explain this. So if you take a falling apple here, it's a heavy object. And it's a nature of heavy objects to descend towards the center of the universe. So here you have something natural, something that is not created by a human being. And therefore the behavior of this natural thing is explained by its very nature, by its inner source of change. It changes because it has to. It, it does whatever it does because it has an inner source of change. Okay? The source of change is from the inside. Why does it want to gather the center of the universe? Because that's what its nature is. Now, the same applies to the reproduction of animals. Why is it that they reproduce? Because that's what their nature dictates them to do. They just want to reproduce. So this was the Aristotelian view. Now compare this with artificial things, such as a ship. Now a ship here is built to obey the orders of a captain. So it's arranged in such a way that it obeys an external command. It doesn't have an inner source of change, you see. They believed that it doesn't have any nature because it's not a natural thing. It's an artificial thing. And what makes a thing artificial? It's when it exists for some external purpose, when its source of change is something else. It doesn't exist for its own sake, you see? Now keep in mind that we no longer accept this distinction. We don't believe that you know, things natural and artificial. I mean, at least we do not believe that there is an insurmountable wall between the two, right? But back then, they believed that there is a clear-cut distinction. One more thing, a clock here 
is constructed to show the correct time to serve an external purpose. Anyone recognizes this particular clock? Anyone uh, has been to Prague, Czech Republic? This is one of the few surviving astronomical clocks. This is actually from 1410. This is a famous Brashsky Orloy. It's a fantastic thing with revolving apostles and stuff. Magnificent thing. Anyways, it's an artificial thing. No matter what it does, its source of change is external. It exists to show the correct time. It doesn't have a nature. If this is clear, then this should also be clear. They believe that there is a strict distinction between natural and artificial, between things with their inner source of change and things with an external source of change. It follows from this that in artificial conditions, a thing cannot behave naturally. You can only behave naturally in a natural condition. If your conditions are artificial, you cannot behave naturally because it's a contradiction. So if you believe in this, and somebody offers you to conduct an observation, would that be an okay thing to do, you think? Yes, it would be an okay thing to do because you do not disturb anything. You're basically just observing. But what about the experiment? If somebody told you, you know what, we have to experiment with whatever to study its nature, what would you say? You'd probably say that experiments, just by their very definition, they presuppose artificial setups. That's what experiment is all about. If you do not impose something artificial, you're not experimenting, you're just observing. Therefore, in order to have an experiment, you must inevitably have an artificial setup. You put these two together and you arrive at a conclusion that experiments are unnatural. In experiments, a thing does not and cannot possibly behave in accord with its nature. Let's take this famous pair, yeah? Famous pair of birds. You cannot possibly grasp the nature of a bird if you lock it in a cage. So this was the basic idea, because this is an unnatural situation. This is an artificial setup. This is not what they are naturally. In order to grasp their nature, you have to observe the bird in its natural environment, you see? Now this is the reason why they didn't allow any sort of experimentation in science. Because they honestly believe that the moment you experiment, you turn in a natural thing into something artificial. That is not how it behaves in nature. And as a scientist, you cannot allow any sort of experimentation because experiments never tell you anything. They never reveal you anything. The only thing that reveals you something is observations. Go out there, sit quietly, and observe. You cannot experiment. If you experiment, that would be artificial. So it wasn't a random decision, you see. It followed from their beliefs. So this was their belief. And we know that by the third law, your methods depend on your beliefs. Once you accept that experiments are unnatural, then you would have to say that if a theory about the nature of a thing relies in any way on experiments, it is unacceptable. The nature is to be studied in observations only. When I first learned that in the medieval science there was no place for experimentation, for me immediately the question was, well, were they stupid? Like, what was wrong with them? Why would they dismiss a whole layer of science? But then when this became obvious, I said, oh, this, this makes sense. Not that we are going to accept this approach, but at least you understand why they dismissed the experimentation. They believed in a strict distinction between artificial and natural, and that led them to forbid all sorts of experimentation. Consider two different categories here. This one is quantitative change. This is a type of change that concerns number, shape, size, anything quantifiable, really. Compare this with a qualitative change, a type of change that concerns qualities of a thing. What sort of qualities? Well, most vivid example is a caterpillar that turns into a chrysalis and then into a butterfly. You see, what happens here is you have an entity that acquires a new quality. In this particular case, a quality of being able to fly. 
it's not merely about size and shape, it's about new quality. If I ever manage to learn a new language, that would be an instance of a qualitative change because I would then acquire a new quality, meaning a capacity to speak that language. And this for the Aristotelians, this wouldn't be a quantitative change. It's not about a number of words that I know, it's not a change of size or shape. What it really is, it's an acquisition of a new quality, the one that we call linguistic intuition, you know, when you sense the language and you feel the language, and it takes a lifetime to acquire that. So that would be an instance of a qualitative change. What about quantitative changes? A quantitative change would be something, well, when you have one or something, then you get two or something, that would be a quantitative change, but let's take a more complex example here. You have a young man that loses some weight, like that, and gains in height. Both of these would be instances of quantitative change because it's measurable. You can express this in numbers. Simple? Right, so far we can agree with the Aristotelians. But there's one thing that we no longer accept, and that is the belief that there is a strict distinction between quantitative and qualitative changes that qualitative changes are not quantifiable. You see, nowadays we no longer believe that there can be a change that cannot possibly be expressed in language of mathematics, that is absolutely unquantifiable. Back then they did believe. They believed that some changes are about number, shape and size, and those changes are quantifiable, meaning expressible in numbers, while other changes are purely qualitative and they are not quantifiable. They are not quantifiable, meaning they are not really expressible in numbers. Two types of change. Again, this is something we no longer accept. But back then, this was one of the foundational beliefs of the worldview. This is something that we can both, meaning us and the Aristotelians, we can all agree. The mathematics essentially deals with things that are quantifiable. If you cannot quantify something, then you cannot really apply mathematics to that. Right? This is almost true by definition. If you cannot express something in numbers, then you cannot really apply arithmetic to that. If you cannot express something in shapes, then you cannot really apply geometry to that. So essentially, it's true almost by definition of mathematics. So mathematics is only applicable to things that are quantifiable. Now, you put these two together, and you arrive at a very disturbing conclusion. that mathematics only has a very limited applicability it doesn't have a universal application, just like we nowadays believe. It has only limited application. So it's not applicable to the instances of qualitative change. Put it here, and by the third law, you arrive at the requirement that says, if a theory attempts to describe an instance of qualitative change by means of mathematics, any sort of mathematics, arithmetic, geometry, it is not acceptable. Suppose you came up with an equation that explains how a butterfly emerges from a chrysalis. Then uh, they're going to say, no, you can't really do that. It's an instance of a qualitative change. You're not really allowed to do that. That was the reason why there was no mathematics in biology for a very long time. There was no mathematics. Only for those cases when you have to deal with the number of species here and there, then you could apply. But when you try to explain some qualitative change, mathematics was forbidden. Now, this brings us to our conclusion. The conclusion is extremely simple. That essentially, what I was trying to show you is that the elements here are interconnected with one another. I think it would be even safe to say that the Aristotelian science managed to reach such a level of structural integrity when all elements are so interconnected with each other and so tightly fit. It reached that level that we have never been able to replicate ever since. We have a much more complex science nowadays to do that, but essentially the Aristotelian science reached a level of organization that has not been replicated since. I had a student a few years ago in my course on the Aristotelian medieval worldview. And after about 10 minutes into the meeting, I realized this student knows nothing, not just about my course, like nothing at all. 
And I said, well, okay, but you see, this is a course on Aristotle. And I have to be honest with you, my question is going to be very simple. Is there anything that you know about Aristotle? He said, well, I know the guy. He owns a restaurant on Danforth. <laughs> I said, right. That's a good beginning because I already have a joke. <laughs> so, okay. But actually, and I'm trying to remain dead serious. I said, but actually, he was born in the 4th century BC. It was a long time ago. And again, he's been dead serious. He said, well, he couldn't be possibly that old, could he? <laughs> now I hope at this stage you know a thing or two about Aristotle. <laughs> now, next time, the Cartesian worldview. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.